know how wonderfully you have interpreted my dream. Mary McLeod Bethune, one of the great heroines of the 20th century in Mary McLeod Bethune. Her story is remarkable, for she was one that was born in 1875, 10 years after the abolishment of slavery. The period 1865 through 1877 was one in which more than 4 million African Americans struggled to make the adjustment from slavery to freedom. Many believe that their civil rights were protected by the 14th Amendment and that their rights to participate in the political process was guaranteed by the 15th Amendment. They were eager to acquire the education, which was denied them as slaves, and sought employment to provide for their economic security. But their expectations were thwarted by white Southerners determined to guide their own destiny and control the Negro. At the conclusion of the Civil War, six Confederate veterans gathered in Pulaski, Tennessee to create the Ku Klux Klan, a vigilante group mobilizing a campaign of violence and terror against the progress of Reconstruction. The first leader, a grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, was Nathan Bedford Forrest, a well-known Confederate general. Within the structure of the Klan, he directed a hierarchy of members with outlandish titles, such as Imperial Wizard and Exalted Cyclops, Hooded Costumes, Violent Night Raids. Lynching in the United States began in the pre-Civil War South in the 1830s and ended during the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 60s. Southerners targeted African Americans, and lynchings in the U.S. reached their height from the 1890s to the 1920s. The Niagara Movement. In 1905, a group of 32 prominent African American leaders met to discuss the challenges facing African Americans and possible strategies and solutions. Because hotels in the United States were segregated, the men convened in Canada at the Erie Beach Hotel on the Canadian side of the Niagara River in Fort Erie, Ontario. As a result, the group became known as the Niagara Movement. The Niagara Movement was formed exclusively by African Americans. In 1908, a deadly race riot rocked the city of Springfield, Illinois, which was the final tipping point that led to the creation of the NAACP. Appalled at this rampant violence, a group of white liberals that included Mary White Ovington and Oswald Garrison Villard issued a call for a meeting to discuss racial justice. Some 60 people, seven of whom were African American, including W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells Barnett, and Mary Church Terrell, signed the call, which was released on the centennial of Lincoln's birth. Fast forward to the 20th century. 1904, she has begun her institution, Bethune-Cookman College, to around 1920, when she begins to really take shape and take hold to her destiny. Remember, she was born in 18... 75, 10 years after the abolishment of slavery and the 13th Amendment. Then uh, 
you had the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenship to newly emancipated slaves, which was ratified in 1868, seven years before she was born. And then you had the 15th Amendment, which gave these newly emancipated slave men the right to vote in 1870 and the 15th Amendment. Fast forward to the 20th century. As soon as World War I was over, Bethune was back giving her full time to the school and the community of Daytona. For the school was forever in need of money and the race situation in Florida demanded exquisite diplomacy. Contrasted with the generous white residents who gave constantly and fully of their support, advice, and encouragement were the bigoted whites who felt that the Negro must be kept in his place and that any effort to help him was liable to encourage him to get out of hand. In Daytona, no Negro was permitted on the peninsula side of town after dark. Just before an election in 1920, the terrifying rumor reached the campus that the Ku Klux Klan was going to march that same night. Night came and the entire city was pitch darkness, and so was the school. They were coming, two men on horseback, carrying flaming crosses, led the procession. Others marched behind them on foot, all shrouded in white wearing masks to conceal their faces. It was a warning to all the residents of Colored Town not to appear at the polls on election day and a promise of what would happen if so much as one Negro tried to vote. She had been educating the Negroes of Daytona for years and doing everything she could to straighten their backs and demand their undeniable rights. There were bound to be repercussions. She, for one, intended to vote in the election, and anyone who wished her to join was welcome to come. The politically powerful KKK had turned off all the street lamps for its demonstration parade, designed to intimidate the entire Negro section and frighten its potential voters away from the poll. But it could not control the lights of the school. Mrs. Bethune ordered that all the lights within Faith Hall be turned off and all the outdoor ones on the campus be turned full on. At 8 o'clock the next morning, when the polls opened, two lines were stretching outside the store, which was the assigned voting place, plainly marked white and colored. The registered Negroes reached far back along the block. Mrs. Bethune walked up and down the uneasy, fearful line, instilling confidence, and the line held. They were not giving in. They were kept standing there all day while the white men entered jovially and departed. Shortly before closing time, they were allowed in as the law decreed and cast their ballots. When the votes were counted, the Klansmen had been defeated and the man of their choice had been elected. In 1920, election day, November the 2nd, Mary McLeod Bethune stared down the evil of the KKK in Daytona Beach and won. Mrs. Bethune would establish a national reputation with the NAACP in 1935 by being the first woman of color to receive the Spingarn Medal, the highest achievement by the NAACP in 1935. And in 1940, she would become vice president of the organization. 1945, she and founder W.E.B. Du Bois would be an established envoy to San Francisco and the formation of the United Nations. Mary McLeod Bethune arguably would be one of the most influential 
women of color of the 20th century being advisor to four U.S. presidents, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Harry S. Truman. Mary McLeod Bethune.